looking at. This is the Big Sci-Fi Podcast. The biggest, most fun podcast in the galaxy. We're Adina, Brian, Chris, and Steve, and we love talking all things science fiction. This is season four, but our human adventure is just beginning as we gather around our computer consoles to discuss the science fiction of film, television, and literature. Join us on our quest for fun and fascination as we go where no podcast has gone before. Everyone has permission to come aboard the Big Sci-Fi Podcast, but make sure to find your seat fast because we're taking off in three, two, one. Hit it. This podcast is a part of the Trek Geeks Network. Greetings, listeners of the Big Sci-Fi Podcast. Prepare yourself. I'm overly excited today. Now, I've been a bit of a fangirl with some of our guests before, but today I might just lose it a little, in a good way, because our guest is science fiction author John Scalzi. Now, I say that name, and there are two types of listeners out there. There are those of you who are also into the literary side of sci-fi, and you know exactly who I'm talking about, and you're like, oh my God, that's bleeping John Scalzi you're talking to, you lucky son of a bleep, bleep, bleep. <laughs> well, and then there are those of you who have not yet been initiated, and you must immediately hit the pause button on this episode, run out, listen to the audiobook version of Red Shirts, narrated by Will Wheaton. And then binge listen to all the rest of Scalzi's novels that were narrated by Will Wheaton. Circle back, read the rest of his catalog, starting with Old Man's War, which is where my own Scalzi saga began. And I have the, the book here because maybe 20-ish, I guess it's it's been almost 20 years. Yeah, when I was visiting my dad one weekend and he puts the paper back in my hand, which I have here. And he says, here, read this. I think you'll like it. And he was right beyond right. So now John has a new book out starter villain, which while I have read, I'm also going to listen to the Wheaton narrated audiobook too. So John, welcome. I'm so excited to talk to you. Thank you. I will try to live up to that uh, that opening track there. I mean, my yes. goodness, I'm excited to meet me too. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. So am I. I, yeah, I know, right? You're excited to meet me too? You, I'm just, you guys didn't know it, but history was being made tonight. It's just... <laughs> We're we're all here to witness it. Yes. <laughs> as I like to say, we're like Hamilton. We are in the room where it happened. Mm -hmm. And here we are. Mm -hmm. Here we are. <laughs> well, I want to say I am um I have known of you, sir, for quite a while. I have a sister-in-law and brother-in-law who love your work and their teenage sons do. You came to the Northeast Ohio area somewhere last year. And mm -hmm. gave a talk, and they all met you, and they said, you've got to start reading his books, Brian. I can't believe you're on a sci-fi podcast, and you haven't read a single Scalzi book. So uh, <laughs> just this week, I started Old Man's War, and I'm loving every second of it, and I can't wait to see what happens next. So um, that's my – and I have red shirts waiting for me next. Oh, so you didn't get to red shirts yet? I didn't, oh I didn't get a chance to, but – you know, kids, uh, you know, and other life. stuff in life. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I am thoroughly enjoying it so far. And, and, and of course, I know of you. And we're very pleased and honored to have you on the podcast. Thanks for taking the time with us. Well, thank you. I, and, you know, here's, here's the magic thing about books is that books are on your schedule. So mm -hmm. whenever you get around to them in between life and children and, you know, it, all the other things that the world throws at you um, when they're, when they're done with that, you still have a book. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, John, I have to be the one, the conscientious observer here who observing because <laughs> I've never read any of your books. <gasps> and don't, don't know. But that's because, because I appreciate I've your reading, honesty. I've been reading. You appreciate that. Crazy <laughs> foolish robots, <laughs> robots, robots everywhere. <laughs> Silly, insane humans, and I'm finishing up Eleven Little Robots, Aww. written this... by this young, up and coming writer. I think it's Adina Miggy Gagnonia, something like that. <laughs> something anyway, something like that. But I have been Gagana. reading science fiction <laughs> since I was in middle school, and when we had uh, David Gerald on the episode, Man Who Wrote Trouble Tribbles. 
Sure. I showed him off my original edition of When Harley Was One, my very first science fiction book. So I've been reading mm. it over the years, but I, I've never read. Now I've got to get red shirts because what I read about it makes it very, uh, it sounds like it's going to be a fun book. Well, and and really, you have to listen to it read by will wheaton and, well, and that's, I, that actually might be the best way to it do really it. really is and yeah. I, I really want to know how did that pairing yeah. come about because he seems so perfect for your work okay Wait. but john i'm not ignorant of you <laughs> because i have watched oh no no, no, no. i don't need death. your i don't need your I, pity no. Steve. <laughs> no, no, no. i'm not i'm not ignorant of you because you wrote four of the best hilarious episodes of love, death, and robots, mm -hmm. I have enjoyed very much that entire series. So when mm -hmm. I saw, oh boy, okay, now I know who's in the room. A right, guy who right. writes about three little robots that are hilarious. And I didn't know that was that episode was my favorite of Love, Death, and the Robots, and I didn't know it was yours until <laughs> until recently. Yeah, which yeah. and we were talking about it. Uh, I think we were talking about it a couple episodes ago on our show. And yeah, I had no idea until recently that that was yours and. I'm not now I'm yeah. not surprised. <laughs> so so if I kind of gravitate towards those four episodes of Love Death and Robe, because that's what I know of your writing sure, style. Sure. Sure. Well, now let, well, let I me mean, answer the question. That, was, that me... is I mean, that is my writing style. So yeah. you, uh -huh. you know, the three robots and the when the yogurt took over uh and the other and the other ones. Um About, uh, that's, uh, yes. that's very Killing much me. Hitler. Yeah. Killing yes. Hitler. Oh, yeah. Killing Hitler <laughs> over and over and over again. Like you would that, <laughs> that the original short story of that was actually nominated for a sidewise award, which is really? the time travel award. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. Me. Okay. So well, don't let me, I, okay, asked, I'm gonna be well, I want to know, you, you I still go. am dying to know my question about how the pairing, the Will Wheaton pairing came up because it's just, it is perfect. Oh, uh, well, yeah. I mean, Will and I had been friends for a while at that point. Um, mm -hmm. We had a friend in common, my, uh, our mutual friend, Michael, um, who has known Will for, for years. Um, and we met because at one point, Will and, and Michael were talking about um, books. And uh, Will was talking about Old Man's War. And he's like, it's a really good book by Charles Gulls. Do you know who he is? And Michael was, yeah, I was in his wedding. So uh, <laughs> so we eventually, uh, you know, uh, got together just, you know, having... Uh, lunch, the three of us, and I became friends with Will. Um, and right around that time, Will was beginning to look into doing audiobook narration. Um, and so when Audible bought uh, a series of my my backlist, um, stuff like Agent to the Stars and Fuzzy Nation and, and stuff like that, um, they were like, is there anybody you can think of that might be uh, good for doing the narration for that? And I mentioned Will. Um, not only because I wanted to help a friend out, but also Will and I are both around the same age. He's a little younger than I am, but we're the same Gen X sort of people. We grew up in the same area. Um, and if you ever listen to the two of us talk, um, it's very clear we have the same rhythms and everything else. Mm -hmm. So uh, I like to say that having Will do my books is just like me doing the books, except better because he is, of course, a professional um, actor. Now, when we got the, to, to Red Shirts, obviously, I, I mean, that was a, a book that would be perfect for him. Um, and I um, I kind of sweetened the deal by dedicating the book to him. Him oh, and nice. my friend Michael. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's like, here's this book. It's dedicated to you. Oh, by the way, do you want to read it? Um, and of course, he was <laughs> perfect for it because he obviously <laughs> knows all about um, Star Trek, and it is a book that is, it's not in the Star Trek universe, but it's so clearly inspired by and has a love of Star Trek and all of its tropes um, that, um, you know, it's just, it's just a perfect pairing beyond the fact that he and I have uh, a lot of similarities in our own personas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very much, you know, looking forward to listening to Starter Villain, uh, with his uh, audio narration too. So I read the book this weekend and sure. in my head, I've got his voice in my head reading it. So hopefully I'm, I'm sure that's, that's exactly how it'll turn out. Cause, uh, but you yeah, know, the, funny goes... thing about, the, 
funny thing about it is, is that people now they they look like I I read your social media posts and I hear Will's voice, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I really can't complain about that, right? You know, they're getting the sort of optimized version of of things when they do that. So mm-hmm. it's you know it's not a it's not an insult to me uh, at all when they say that. Um, and I'm very happy, and I think Will's happy about it too. Um, that our professional re- relationship mirrors our actual uh, personal friendship to such a great degree. Yeah, well, I, I definitely look forward to. I'm hoping that this this pairing and this professional relationship and everything continues because I think it's it's great. It's very entertaining. So, Starter Villain, uh, which is just just coming out, just out. What do you want people to know about this book? Um, it's the best book that's ever been written. Um, and literally modest, you know, modest. Yeah, I like you know, that. I'm, oh, I'm going to come the up book. and say, say four, you know, 4 billion years of evolution <laughs> led up to this exact moment. Um, no, no. I mean, it's very much of, uh, it's very much of a thing where, um, so the last book I wrote was called Kaiju Preservation Society. Um, and basically what it was is a kind of a modern, takes place in modern time and it plays with a bunch of nerd tropes and this in that case was with um godzilla and the idea of you know these great big creatures running around um and i basically had so much fun doing that and the response to that has been so positive um that when it came time to think about what the next book would be um both i and tor were like well why don't we just ride this pony for see you know how far it goes Mm -hmm. and as it happened i had been thinking about um villains particularly like james bond villains um Mm. and the practical aspects of villainy like how would you actually Mm -hmm. make it work um so i was basically i want to do this story where a guy inherits his uncle's super villainy business and tor was like that sounds great go ahead and do that um so it was a, it was a combination of personal interest and also you know we caught a wave we caught a wave with kaiju and we, want, and we wanted to ride um that wave and uh see where it uh led us and it led us to starter villain cool yeah and kaiju so for the audience uh is up for a hugo award it's one of the nominees which is awesome yeah so, thank you yeah and it was also again a, a great book i heartily heartily recommend it and i heartily recommend the audio version of it as mm. well yeah, it's it's it is that it's really that's, good. That's the book that my nephews read that they just oohed and odd over, mm-hmm. just just <laughs> could not stop talking about. So uh, Xander and Logan, give them a shout out there, uh, the yeah. Baker well, boys. So well, thank you, Xander and Logan. Mm-hmm. You rock. <laughs> and that was, if I heard you correctly, when I saw you at the National Book Festival, you said um, that one just kind of came out like all at once, and you just wrote it, which is yeah. amazing to me. Yeah, no, that's that's accurate. I had been trying to write a previous book, and this was in 2020, um, and it was supposed to be a dark and gritty political thriller in space. Uh, and it turned out uh, 2020 was a bad year to be trying to write dark and gritty anything, <laughs> much less in space. Um, and so basically my brain was just grinding gears on it for most of a year, um, and then I finally had to admit defeat on it. And I actually had to send an email to my editor going, I can't write this book. I hate I hate it, and I hate it way it makes me feel. And he was like, fine, we'll figure out something else to do. And that was going to become the first time I had ever blown a deadline. And as a former journalist, the idea of blowing a deadline mm-hmm. is just, you know, it's just the thing you don't do. Um, and so I went to go take a shower um, after I had all this flop sweat saying I can't do this anymore. Um, and that's where the back of my brain was like, Hey, now that you're not doing this thing that you were never actually ever going to finish anyway, here's this entire idea. It's called the Kaiju Preservation Society and literally just whoop the whole idea for the story. Now it's like, it was dec- you know, dictated to me by Godzilla or anything like that. I still had to do the writing and the characters and everything else like that. But the, basically the concept and the arc of the story, uh, was, all there and so it really was just sit down do all the typing don't think about it too hard have fun with it enjoy it um and so i had a six-week deadline at that point and i got it in in five weeks mm. you wrote a novel in five weeks 
Yeah, that's not even that's not even the Pe quickest I've pe written. People one. have a hard <laughs> time even writing up their plans for the next five weeks in five weeks. Steve, 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 ask me what what is the shortest amount of time that I've written a novel? What's the shortest amount of time you've ever written a novel, John? Two weeks. Oh my goodness. How long was, was that novel? Uh it was it was uh the usual length of, of one of my novels. It's actually The Consuming Fire. It's the second book in the really? Independence series. Yeah, so, no, I'm, and that was I just I had just let my schedule get away from me. I looked on, on my schedule and it was it was June 4th. And I'm like, oh, and my book is due, due June 18th. I guess I should start writing that. And I remember <laughs> and, and I remember saying to, to Chrissy, my wife, I'm like, slide food under the door. There'll be a jug by the door once a day that needs to be emptied. And uh, I, yeah. you know, do that. Yeah. And she was like, well, no, no to the jug, but everything else. And so I ended up writing about 8,000 words a day. It helped that I had already like plotted the story out and I knew yeah. where everything was going and everything else like that. So it was a lot of just typing. Um, but I don't recommend it. It was 8,000 words a day and I was absolutely miserable. And when I was done, uh, Chrissy tells me it basically took me an entire week until I would actually could actually speak again. Mm. So, yeah. So yeah. five weeks is five weeks is doable. Um uh, two weeks is not. And I don't really like doing the five week thing either, except under duress, which was basically what this was. When people are like, oh, it took you five weeks to write it. It's actually no, it took me five weeks, plus the entire year where I was not writing that other book. And I was super frustrated. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can I can type very fast. So if I know what I'm writing, I can also do quite a bit in a day. But that's right. I don't get that stretches of I don't get the stretches of time to do that. And yes, I can understand being miserable because one of my favorite things about writing is thinking about the details. So I might want to write like a thousand two words or two thousand words, and then let things simmer and figure out details sure. and go away and then come back and because that's some of the the fun stuff is like making. But what what I'm interested in with the Kaiju Preservation Society, when you say that, though, is there is some fairly significant like world building and consistency stuff that you still need to do. So after you wrote, did you do you go back and make sure that all those things matched up? And because you had For a continuity. Yeah. Or is that, is so, that an editor? No, I mean, that's no. Uh, when I typed the end, I was done and I sent it in. Wow. Um, and that, then that was everything. And the, and there was very, very, very little editing um, mm. done on the book post. Now, when I say that, it makes it sound like it's just like shove it off and go, I don't live in the past and I don't do stuff. <laughs> but what it really means is that I edit as I go along. Gotcha. Right. So it, it, it's what I call like a rolling draft mm -hmm. um, instead of going back and revising, like doing the whole thing and then going back and doing a revision and then doing a revision of a revi revision revision. I just go and uh, fix things as I go along, which is an artifact of the fact that I've always written on a computer, right? Mm -hmm. um, the whole idea of like drafts, first draft, second draft, mm -hmm. third draft is, is an artifact of either writing it out by hand and then it needs to be keyed in or doing it in typewriter and literally having to cut and paste and change things and rekeying that in as well. If you're writing on the computer, you don't have to do the rekeying. You can just do the rolling draft, which is what I do. Mm -hmm. um, but it also is the it was the, you know it's also the thing that I write fairly cleanly, and this is again um, the matter of being uh, a journalist uh, in mm -hmm. my past. Um, so uh, when things came up that like you know I, I often say like you know something will come up in chapter thirteen where I'm like oh I should probably uh, put something in earlier to make it sound like, you know, it's being, something's being paid off. I will go back and I'll insert a line or a paragraph or something like that in mm -hmm. chapter three. And then when it comes out, it looks like, you know, it was there all along. People right. don't see, people don't see the process. They just see the mm -hmm. end result. Yes. Um, yeah. So, but for me, um, because I edit as I go along and I'm a fairly quick writer, um, it, usually when I type the end, uh, it's off to Patrick, my editor, and uh, and then it becomes officially his problem until <laughs> and unless he sends me back uh, editorial notes. And most of the okay. editorial notes that I've gotten over the course of my career have been very, very short. Like I can tweak uh, tweak it within a sentence or two. Mm -hmm. oh, and wow. again, That's... since it's on a computer, you're able to go in and make those edits rather simply and easily as opposed to uh, 
as you say, cut and pasting with the on, 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 from, a, from from a typewriter. Right. Uh, yeah. No. I, I I often think about the fact that because I literally started writing short stories um, in high school the same year that the very first Macintosh came out. Right. So computers have always been my writing tool of choice. Um, and I'm pretty sure that if I had to write, if I had started writing on a typewriter, I may have just been like, the hell with this. I'm, you know, going to become a Walmart greeter or something like that because just <laughs> so much more work. Ugh. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm starting I'm to feel. Lazy, I'm a lazy, lazy man. And uh, <laughs> typewriters don't work for me. I'm feeling sorry for Ray Bradbury having to type on a Selectric or something like that. <laughs> he did the, the Selectric, and it was the – he got a dime for every half hour. He was at the library, and he just kept shoving dimes in while he was going <laughs> yeah. to the yeah, That's was, why he was typing so fast. I recently <laughs> read uh, his – Bradbury's book. He has Zen uh, – it's like a – Zen of writing or Zen on writing or something like that. And he was talking about, especially in his early days, how he had to rent a typewriter at yeah the library yeah. or the Y. And mm -hmm. yes, yeah. and he was under deadline pressure and the the financial of you're paying for it. And there was no air conditioning in the basement of the Y. So he's like Ugh. in his underwear sweating and having to get stuff out. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah no, I'm, I'm way too soft for that. I, you know, <laughs> yeah. 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 Except for the bo <laughs> bo bottle, except for the bucket. Yeah. You know. So, yeah. so can I ask you a question about when part partly your process? But I'm a musician, and uh -huh. I've been dabbling in writing a little bit too. And um, I love having thematic music playing when I'm writing. Do you like to listen to music, or do you just like the silence and let your brain run that way, or? Generally speaking, I don't listen to music while I'm uh, writing because uh, it distracts me. Like if mm. it is something that has lyrics, if mm -hmm. it's if it's something that's new to me, I'll be paying attention to the lyrics and not to what I'm writing. So that's no good. Um, and then otherwise, you know, I, I very much get into music. So it's just uh, an attractive nuisance when I'm trying to mm -hmm. trying to focus. I'll listen to music when I'm like doing emails, right. Or something gotcha. else like that, where gotcha. it's not, a, not a creative aspect. It's just more mm -hmm. of responding to what people are saying, but mm -hmm. um, I don't need like perfect silence or anything like that. That's not what it is, but gotcha. I don't need, I don't need something that pulls my attention mm -hmm. and, and music uh, absolutely uh, pulls um, my attention away. And um and I, you know, which is, again, not to say that I don't enjoy music. I enjoy it quite a lot. I used to be a music critic in, mm. in my past life. And these days, I'm actually uh, making some music. I just released uh, an LP on Spotify uh, last week, uh, which is a way I describe it is a four-part Neo ambient exploration of repetition and recurrence, which, as we know, is exactly what the kids are listening to these days. So I expect <laughs> to be opening for Taylor Swift anytime soon. Right. Well, right. you know what you just described. So I saw that you had posted that, but I didn't listen to it yet. But what you the way you described it, like, I, I don't know if you're being serious or not, but that sounds exactly what my 13 year old is listening to these days. It's kind of funny. No, yeah. the thing is, is that um, so when I was when I was younger, um, I would listen to a lot of uh, Brian Eno and the idea yeah. behind ambient yeah. music and the music mm -hmm. for airports and stuff like that. Uh, and that uh, sort of stuff is is fascinating to me. Not when I was a teenager. When I was a teenager, I was listening to like The Cure and Depeche Mode and all of mm. that sort of stuff. I was a very 80s kid. But I'm talking like in my 20s and I was mm -hmm. like listening to. Brian Eno and Harold Budd and, you know, a lot of George Winston, actually, we still listen mm -hmm. to that to fall asleep. Um, and uh, so when I'm going down, I, my COVID project uh, was creating a music uh, room. So I bought a whole bunch of instruments. Um, I overbought and then I bought a computer <laughs> with, a, with a DAW. Um, if you want to, if you want to have fun, uh, Brian, uh, go to Google and Google Scalzi the Beast, and you will see one of my uh, COVID purchases. Okay. Oh, I think I know what you're talking. I think I know what I, you're talking yes, about. Don't, yeah. don't spoil it for him. I won't. Don't I won't. Spoil it for I'm, him. I'm looking it up right now in real time. Uh, okay. Well, we will. We will continue talking, <laughs> and when you find it, we will know because. Okay. We, okay. Yes. Well, so uh, so. 
one of the things yeah, that I, I kind of want to know, uh, again, I'm going to jump around back to red shirts is so in order to write that book, you had to have been at least a little bit of a Trek fan. Sure. I how mean, much, how much, of, how much, how deep is your Trek fanness? I wouldn't say it is. Um, it's not like Trimble level of, uh -huh. of fanness, um, but certainly I enjoyed the the series and certainly I enjoyed, you know, Star Trek. I mean, if you had to be like the binary Star Trek or Star Wars, I'm much more on the Star Trek side of things. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, as far as it goes, um, I was not, um, this is kind of weird to, to tell people, but I didn't like get into the science fiction community uh, until I actually was in my 30s. Um, I'd never been to a science fiction convention until I went to TorCon, which was in 2003, after I'd sold Old Man's War. Um, and so my association with Star Trek um, was not was not deep. It was not a fandom sort of mm -hmm. thing. It was just more, I watch it because, you know, science fiction is a cool sort of thing. But, you know, um, obviously by the time that I got around to writing Red Shirts, um, I had been in Star Wars, uh, Star, you know, the uh, science fiction community for a very long time. I had, I had friends who were in Star Trek, um, and I was obviously, as a former film critic and commentator about stuff, I was very well versed in um, mm -hmm. both the actual like um, series and movies, and then of course also just the business of Star Trek as mm -hmm. well. So I had more than enough uh, to work with. Right. Are you watching any of the the new shows that are out? I've really been enjoying um, Strange New Worlds. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's just very well done, um, very enjoyable, and and I like that it's episodic as opposed to having like a a through line all the way through. And of course, I really like Lower Decks as well. Yes. It was really funny. Uh, yes. Yes. It was really yes, funny yes. when Lower Decks came out. People are like, they're stealing from Red Shirts. I was like, what is the name of my book? You know, <laughs> literally, literally, Star Trek cannot steal anything from me that I did not already thieve. So um, one of the one of the things that I actually did was before Red Shirts came out, um, I actually went into the um, trademark database to make sure that um, that Paramount hadn't trademarked red shirts mm. right because oh, really wow because that would be that would be something that i would assume that they would have i mean I, I would have if i were them um but apparently they had not and i had an alternate title for red shirts if that was the case it was going mm. to be called away team but red shirts, oh. is, so red shirts much is so much better, better. oh my god mm -hmm. yes. well mm -hmm. it's very yeah. very to the point of who yeah. these poor pathetic <laughs> individuals were yeah wow. is this guitar thing real Oh yes, is it that is what real. that is? Yeah. The beast? That is, yeah, that is, look, look at up. that. For, for everybody who's listening to this who who does not have context, the beast <laughs> is a six-necked guitar, and actually each of the necks is a different kind of guitar. There's a twelve-string. <sighs> there's a six-string with a okay. Floyd Royce tremolo. There's a five-string bass, a four-string bass, a seven-string guitar for when you're genting, and then of course uh, <laughs> another six-string, but that's strung as a baritone bass. And so, it's so, um, it's all one guitar, but it has six necks. So I've never yeah. seen anything like that in my life. You, uh, you've yeah. created a new term. You've created a new term: the one man guitar band. It's it's absolutely ridiculous. And I remember, <laughs> like I said, I was building this music room, uh, and I saw that that was going up for auction, and I put in a bid when I didn't expect to get it. Um, but when I <laughs> mentioned to Chrissy, my wife, that I had done it. And I was like, I'm buying it as art, right? You know, yeah, because, yeah, yeah. you know, it's the centerpiece of the it's uh, magnificent. The I mean, it yeah. really is. But it is a functional guitar. It, you can play it. It's not super well designed because all the necks are active at once, but mm. it's playable. It is playable. And there are videos on YouTube um, there's a fellow uh, who is playing actually Iron Maiden's Number of the Beast, which makes sense because it's called the Beast. Um, <laughs> but I remember betting, uh, bidding on it. And I'm like, I'm not going to win this, and I <laughs> won it. And it fortunately was unfortunately was in the UK, so it had to be shipped. And Ooh. that was kind of an adventure in itself. But this is relevant because I'm go go with me here. Yeah. So 
I call the, you know, I call the auction house and they're like, well, we're not going to ship it. You need a specialized shipper. So I, they give me the name of the specialized shipper and they were like, oh no, you need another person even more specialized than this. <laughs> and I finally get these people who like ship weird things all over the world. Um, and they go and they do it and they, they create a crate for it and they, you know, mm-hmm. pack it. Um, and they're, you know, and they're sending me the bill of lading and everything, all the information. And at the very end of it, they're like, um, so here's all this information. Here's when it's going to arrive. This is how it's going to arrive. Oh, by the way, red shirts and lock in are my favorite novels of yours. Oh, that's and I was great. Like, so, <laughs> that's awesome. So, you know, so I knew it was going to arrive in one piece because this person knew who I was mm-hmm. and, you know, was a fan. So that was uh, really the the most random time that having become a science fiction writer really worked out to my benefit. Nice. That that, that was the only time? That, I mean, kind of. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> here's the thing is, is that it's not... It's not a um, it's not a thing that really you know uh, you get a whole lot of perks from. No, what? wait. No, I've been laboring know. this whole time. <laughs> no, kidding. although I will say this. I mean, sometimes the you know you find out who are fans and and it's it's kind of wild. Um, there was uh, one time where I was um, minding my own business and all of a sudden people were pinging me on the now former Twitter. Um, apparently Tom Hanks had written about reading red shirts and he was like, Oh my goodness. You know, just, just read red shirts. And now I'm going to write, read everything else that John Scalzi has ever written. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, well, that's cool. And then I'm on tour for a book. Um, and my wife gives me a call, uh, and she says, um, some fan mail arrived like in the mail, which mm-hmm. never happens anymore. She says, his fan mail's right. And I'm like, okay, so what? And she's like, it's from Tom Hanks. And I'm like, oh, take wow. a picture of that. And <laughs> wow. That and so I'm doing my, I'm doing my event and literally, you know, my phone bings and it's my wife saying, here's that, that letter. And I'm, so I'm up there and it's in, uh, mm. It's in um, Lansing, Michigan. I remember this. It's Lansing, Michigan. So I'm like, hey, everybody, I just got a fan letter from Tom Hanks. You want me to read it to you? And they're like, yes, obviously we do. And so <laughs> I'm reading this because he types because he's a typewriter fan. Right. right? He's got right. these magnificent old typewriters. So it's typewritten. And he's talking about how he loved you know, the books. And he makes this reference to an agent to the stars. I talk about this movie that he's done called Gold Master. It's just like a throwaway line. But he says, P.S., Gold Master is my favorite movie of mine as well. I'm like, oh, my God, he actually has read all of this stuff. And so <laughs> so literally an entire room of nerds just geeking out about this stuff. And then I'm going on tour still, and I land in L.A., and my manager calls me. He's like, you got to go to the Chateau Maman. I'm like, why am I going to the Chateau Maman? He's like, you're having lunch with Tom Hanks. And I'm like... <laughs> Oh, okay. okay. And, I can and do so that. I get dropped off at the Chateau Marmont. I'm like 15 minutes early and <laughs> I don't know what to do. So I call my friend Michael, the one who I knew uh, Will through. And I'm like, guess where I am? And he's like, I don't know. And I like, I'm at the Chateau Marmont. He's like, why are you there? I'm like, I'm having lunch with Tom Hanks. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. And we're back and forth, back and forth. I go in to the, you know, to the restaurant for Chateau Marmont. Um, and you know, go up to the hostess's t- uh, stand and be like, I'm here for my lunch with Tom Hanks. And they're like, well, Tom's not here yet. Because, of course, it's Tom to the hostess of Chateau Maman. Um, and they're like, but, he, you know, have a seat and uh, and you can wait. And they're asking me, like, why are you having lunch with, with Tom Hanks? And I'm like, well, because um, he likes my books. And they're like, oh, well, what do you write? And I was like, I write science fiction. Well, we like science fiction. What have you written? And so I'm talking to them. And Tom Hanks walks up. And he's like, what's going on? And I'm like, <laughs> they were asking what I do and, and what I write. And, and he goes, you've never heard of John Skulls. And he reaches into his statue. Oh, and my And he gosh. out his iPad. And he starts scrolling through wow. his, you know, ebook reader, and he has literally everything I've ever written. And he's just like, "There's this, and there's this, and there's this." And generally speaking, if you can have Tom Hanks be your hype man, absolutely do this. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm just sitting there, just like, "What even is my life anymore?" Um, <laughs> and we had a we had a very very nice lunch, and he's a lovely person. I, I, you know, it's the thing of you. You think of Tom Hanks and you're like, I bet he's a really nice guy. He is, in fact, 
just about the loveliest person um, that that I've I've ever met. Wow. I mean, I, I don't know if he goes up to, you know, Mr. Rogers territory or anything like hmm. that, but I've never met Mr. Rogers. So um, he played him. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> so, anyway, that's that, but besides that. And the shipping, no, science fiction has never done anything. For me. Mm, I'm pretty uh-huh. sure there's going to be a few other things if <laughs> yeah. we, that we, we, can, we can pull out. So you mentioned Agent of Star, which is also, again, f- really fun story. People should absolutely read and listen to that, too. In fact, again, same thing. The whole I, I mentioned at the beginning, the whole catalog. So which mm. out of your books is your favorite? book oh i mean just ask me which of my children is my favorite well right. I i'm asking you that <laughs> response thank I, you thank I have you only one child so <laughs> she is my favorite um i don't know you know the thing is is that each of them have kind of like a um i don't want to say each of them has a special place in my heart but they kind of do because each of them represents a mm-hmm. particular time and place um that said the one that i'm kind of attached to more sentimentally than others um is is zoe's tale which is the fourth mm-hmm. book in the old man's war series okay. um and it was originally written because tor came to me and they were like could you write something that we can put into uh middle grade and high school um libraries right uh and i was like okay i'll write this story uh telling basically telling the uh, last colony story from the point of view of the daughter um because i was thinking well you know if we're going to actually put this into the ya you know slot then i can make this trilogy and then it will be part of you know it kind of its own thing i wasn't going to make the assumption that anybody who was reading zoe's tale would have read anything else um in the books and stuff like that so i wrote it as kind of as a standalone ya and then they went ahead and just put it out in the adult channel anyway so i get great grief from people it's like you just told the same story it's like well it wasn't meant for you so shut up um (laughs) but uh uh but um the thing about it was it was the first time that i had extensively written uh a female character right a woman uh and a young woman at that a, a 16 year old um and i have never been a 16 year old girl um mm-hmm. and so i was like how do you and my daughter was at the time eight so she was no help um and i was like so how do i write a a 16 year old girl and make make it sound like a 16 year old girl and all my male friends were absolutely unhelpful they're like well just go hang around with 16 year old girls and i'm like do you even uh, no, hear the no. words that are coming out of your mouth right now uh I, at that time i was almost 40 uh and i was like so that's a big no yeah uh, now but as it happens i knew people who had been 16 year old girls my wife one very robin and cool <laughs> Uh, who is a Hugo Nebula and Locus award-winning writer herself. And you're competing um, with her this for, for this next... We're not competing, and but we'll come back to that. Yeah, okay, uh, okay. Uh, but, um, so, but anyway, but the thing about it was, um, I, uh, you know, so I started writing this character as a, as a girl, and I was just always getting it wrong. And I went through mm. so many revisions to try to get that character right. Uh, and when she finally clicked in my head, you know, then it was so much more work than anything else that I'd done in terms of writing. Mm. Um, and so then it got, uh, eventually it came out, it did perfectly well. Um, and it got nominated for a Hugo. Uh, and I knew I wasn't going to win that year because I was up against uh, Corey Doctorow, Charlie Strauss, and the two Neils, Neil Gaiman and Neil uh, Stevenson. So it really was one of those, I'm just glad to be here. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, Thanks. But the thing that I was happy with was that it was nominated at all. And what that meant was I had gotten that character right, right? Mm -hmm. Because the entire book stands or falls on that particular character. Mm -hmm. So for the amount of work that it, that it was and for, you know, what it was doing, uh, I had that. And also it's dedicated to my daughter and she did finally read it uh, when she was a teenager. Um, And I have to say that I was kind of imagining because my daughter was eight years old at the time. I was kind of imagining what I expected that she would be like when she was 16 years old when I wrote Zoe and kind of nailed it. So I'm pretty happy about that. Cool. cool. Now to go back to your thing about competing with, with uh, well, you're Mary both, Robin. You're both nominated this year. Yeah, we're both finalists this year. Um, and um, here's the thing that I always say about um, Hugo's and I'm, 
I can be very blase about them because I have three, right? Um, is that um, when you get when you're when you're a finalist, um, what you do is you look at your you look at the field of other finalists, and if there's nobody that you would be just really really upset to have lost to, mm -hmm. um, then then it's all good, right? Because if you win, that's great, um, and if you lose, then you mm. lost to uh, someone who you you know that you're like well that was that was a good choice mm -hmm. um now for me you know like this year is what it's uh mary robinette it's travis baldry it's sylvia uh it is um oh, who wrote nona tamson muir um and there's somebody else that i'm forgetting because my brain is swiss cheese at the moment but the point of it is <laughs> oh uh uh, Ursula Vernon under T.K. Mm -hmm. Kingfisher. Um, all of these people are just really good writers. All of their books are really good. There's nobody that I would be upset to lose to and quite a few that I would be happy if they won. If I win, then I'm Hugo Winner John Scalzi. And if I lose, then I'm Hugo Winner John Scalzi. I don't mm -hmm. need to win anymore. Mm -hmm. I've already sure. won that battle and mm -hmm. it's done. So um, it's like get, get away and make room for the new people. Well, you know, and this is the whole thing is, is that when people are like, are you nervous? I'm like, no, you know, it's like, what, what if you don't win? I'm like, how many times do you want me to win? How many times? Because I give me a number, yeah. you know, yeah. um, like I said, I have three. I have mm -hmm. three Hugo. You know, that's three more than almost everybody else in the world has got. Three more than I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And how, how uh, well, did you feel about winning the first one then? The you mean for the best novel one or the no, no, very your first very one. first Hugo the very first when they they when they contacted you when they how did they do like do they send you a you know carrier pigeon message or, hey <laughs> guess what John you just won the Hugo award no, where no, do you want to go next you get, Disneyland you, email, you, know? you get an email that from the from the WorldCon that year uh -huh. um, and they say you have been nominated or you're a finalist because we use finalists now um, you're a finalist do you accept um, and if you say yes, then you uh, then they will announce you after uh, like a week or two weeks. And um, there's that weird period where once you get your um, your email saying, hey, you, you're a finalist, do you accept? Um, and you can't talk about it until they do the release. Um, there's a period where everybody in science fiction is like, hey, how are things going? Uh, <laughs> getting any emails recently? Wink, um, wink, nod, <laughs> nod, got yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So like, who else is doing that thing? Um, but uh, the very first time I was ever actually nominated for a uh, Hugo was after Old Man's War, which was my first novel came out. Um, and I had been already nominated for the Campbell. And then a week later, they're like, oh, we forgot to send this to you. You're also nominated for best novel. Um, and I was like, no, I wasn't. Somebody dropped. <laughs> Yeah, somebody actually find the novel because there's no way that they would have been like, oh, silly us, we forgot to tell you best novel, right? Why would someone um, decline? Uh, it was, I, I will tell you, it was Neil Gaiman. And the reason Neil Gaiman declined was for each of the past three years, he had won uh, a Hugo. He'd won it for... Um, a, sh a short story. Okay. He won it for novella, mm -hmm. and he won it for novel for American Gods. Mm -hmm. So he had been nominated again for Anansi Boys, um, and his thinking was he had been. I think is basically it's like, well, I've won enough right now. It's time to let somebody else. Somebody else will benefit mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the more. Um, I like him more now. Yeah, and he was absolutely right because it mm -hmm. absolutely changed the you know the you know sort of the tenor of what was going on because at the time I was the first person in two decades to be simultaneously uh, nominated for the Campbell Award, which is now known as the Astounding Award for Best New Writer and for Best Novel as well. Mm -hmm. So it went from oh there's John Scalzi to oh there's John Scalzi, right? Mm -hmm. There's just you know it made a huge huge difference. Um, so people do occasionally drop. So I remember. So I remember that um, I knew that I wasn't going to win. That was Robert Charles Wilson's year that year. But I didn't care because just being nominated was awesome. Mm -hmm. um, the first one I won was for actually fan writer for my blog, which as we are as as we are recording this is actually the uh, just past its 25th anniversary of of existing in the world. Um, 
And I was thrilled because, you know, having uh, the, you know, I, people were like, is he a fan writer? He's written novels and stuff like that. And the answer was absolutely. I was a fan writer on my blog. I was talking about science fiction and I was talking about the science fiction community. I wasn't getting paid for it because it's a blog. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, the, the way I felt about that was this was the science fiction community as expressed mm -hmm. through world con voters saying yes you are part of our community and so i was actually deeply thrilled and honored to get that specific one and then when i won the best novel hugo um for red shirts um about uh you know in 2013 uh the way i felt about it was thrilled uh and also deeply relieved because mm. there's so much mm. there's so much pressure not so much pressure but you know no matter how cool you want to be about it, you know, you do get worked up in, in your brain um, about a best novel, uh, Hugo. And having won it, uh, I was relieved because now I would never have to win it again, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if I do win it again, like if they decide to give it to me this year for, um, you know, uh, for Kaiju Preservation Society, I will happily take it. Mm -hmm. But that you like like you were saying you're at you've already been to the top of the mountain it's perfectly fine for you to say to other people come up and look at the view you don't mm -hmm. have to mm -hmm. try to keep shoving everybody off it's not king of the hill it is you know you go and you look around and you're like this is an amazing view hey come up here and mm -hmm. take a look at it and it's been really exciting for me in the 10 years <laughs> since i won for red shirts to have so many friends you know Anne lecky um, mm. Mary Robinette, uh, Nora, um, having having won the the Hugo and feeling really happy and proud for them. So, mm. um, like I said, if if the voters this year um, decide that that Kaiju is the one that they want to give the the novel uh, award to, I will take it and I will be happy and I will be uh, delighted to put it up with the rest of my Hugos. If they give it to somebody else, that's awesome too, because everybody who is nominated this year has written a good book and they all deserve to win it. Thank you for listening to part one of our interview with science fiction author John Scalzi. We'll have part two available next week. Make sure you like, subscribe, follow, share any way, anyhow you can on all your social media platforms. And don't forget, we have a new merch store, which you can find in our podcast notes, the link to that. On behalf of the entire Big Sci-Fi Podcast crew, I'd like to say, Coconut! I've always wanted to do that. Until next time.